Today we'll be covering some Linux and open source news. It's an exciting one today with talks on struggles with Acai Linux, improvements to Qt 6.9, app the package manager gets a much needed overhaul, Rust is asking for help, and much more. Let's get right into it as over the last couple months, the Acai Linux team has been struggling as two main maintainers have officially stepped down, including Hector Martin and Acai Lina. So it's been hard on the team to not only continue development, but also fill those voids as those were big members of the Acai Linux team. Acai Linux brings Linux to Apple Silicon. They changed up their project on how exactly it's managed with a project governance board now that includes seven different people. The big news, however, is bringing Linux to Apple is getting much harder now, especially with the M4 chips. When comparing them to the M1 and M2, the Acai Linux team, which has successfully reverse engineered some of the Apple hardware for Linux support, found that Apple just recently made a technical change on how the M4 boots, which is going to give them major issues. Not only that, but with the M4, it also changed the way that they handle secure environments. This, of course, matters to Linux as the team is trying to get Linux working on Apple Silicon hardware natively. And with Apple trying to consistently create things that are more locked down, it's going to delay and set back the team even further. As Sven Peter here says, looks like M4 support for Acai Linux is going to be rather painful. We're still focusing on upstreaming the M1 and M2 support, but with other people having been trying to bring up M1 N1 on M4, and it looks like a few things have changed. When configuring a macho boot object, we now get dropped into an environment where Apple's SPTM is running in GL2, and we're supposed to talk to it from EL2 with MMU already enabled to set up page tables. This neither works for Linux nor for running XNU under our hypervisor to reverse engineer the new hardware. Ouch, what a blow for the Acai Linux team, especially after losing two of their major maintainers and members. What will the future look like for this team? It's uncertain at the moment, but wishing them the best either way. Good luck trying to reverse engineer Apple's closed source and proprietary systems. Another big deal, Qt 6.9 is released officially and is available with major improvements for developers. Things like more visualizations with Qt graphs, the 3D and virtualization tools have received enhanced upgrades. Things like order independent transparency and new spline graph support, all valuable for the scientific, industrial, and UI heavy Linux applications. Kind of cool what you're able to do at this point with Qt. They got improved emoji handling. Goofy, I know, but we have the latest emoji and Unicode standards, and that helps Linux applications that need global text rendering, so definitely a win regardless. SVG and CSS animations have seen improvements. We now have our first implementations of animations for fill, color, stroke, and transform properties, all making the upgrade to Qt 6.9 a very solid and future-ready release. Of course, it's always important for Linux developers relying on Qt for professional UIs, embedded devices, and cross-platform applications. It's definitely exciting to see these major improvements. And a word for all of the people that are on Qt 5, the standard commercial support for Qt 5.15 will end after the 26th of May in 2025. So if the features don't get you to update, well, the end of life will eventually, depending on which version of Qt you're currently developing with. It's cool to see updates to this framework. I'll be covering in the future. So make sure to subscribe below as YouTube can get finicky and you wouldn't want to miss another Linux news video like this. Also, make sure to smash that like button as we're going to get into how apt is going to be redesigned. That's right, the core package manager used by Debian and Ubuntu is now officially in stable release. App 3.0 brings new features as well as a better user experience. It includes a new package solver for smart dependency handling and refined text-based UI, including better colors, better formatting, and overall just user experience improvements. It's quite exciting to see as we don't usually see such updates with the package manager. Here's a wonderful screenshot that I found on the web, kind of getting a look and feel for the latest version three of apt. Why does this matter to Linux? Well, with better dependency solving, the new package manager has a solver that improves how apt handles complex package dependencies, reducing conflicts and broken installs, which a lot of us have probably ran into using apt. It can be very annoying dealing with uh, broken packages here, specifically with apt, but we're gonna see improvements on that also. With improvements on the user experience, new things like the color output and clear formatting, as we can tell here, you know, it tells you exactly, okay, evolutions being installed in green, what dependencies have to come in with it. I know that a lot of you have complained about this in the past because if you want to see how the older app versions worked, you can look 
right here on the right hand side. So this is really an old versus new comparison here. And you can just see how much better the layout looks. You can tell exactly what's being summarized, what the download size is, what the installed size is, how many packages are getting added, removed, and so on and so forth. Much better than just reading through a mess of text that's well not even properly formatted, no spacing between it, all the same color. It just became a mess to even understand what exactly you were doing whenever you were trying to install a package. A much needed redesign here. I'm super excited for the improved user experience here, making this wonderful package manager that's used across the board with any Debian and Ubuntu systems even better. Now, one thing I'll mention is Ubuntu 25.04 will probably see this and so will Debian 13. So that's exciting as it's gonna be setting up the tone for the next generation of Debian based systems. Let me know what you think about this in the comment section below. Did the formatting get better? Do you like this? Are there other improvements that they can make? I'd love to hear about it and the team I'm sure would love to read about it. So app 3.0 is going to be an awesome leap forward with better formatting and command support. And while they're trying to make that all better, Rust is asking us for help. That's right, they want you to take a survey as Rust turns 10 years old officially. They say it's a good time to step back and assess where we are at and to get aligned around where we should be going. Where Rust is succeeding at empowering everyone to build reliable, efficient software, as it says on our webpage, question mark, where are there opportunities to do better? To that end, we have taken on the global of authoring a Rust Vision RFC with the first milestone to prepare a draft for review at the upcoming Rust All Hands. This is kind of a big deal as Rust has been controversial, at least in the Linux kernel as of late. It'll be interesting to see what people end up saying in these surveys. And it's wild to think that Rust has been out for 10 years now. It's a natural time to kind of reflect on Rust growth and, and where to go from here. It's nice to see that instead of making top-down decisions, the team is trying to align the language's evolution with real world needs. So it's asking people, including engineers and developers, just what they need from the language. This is your chance to help shape up the language. If you are a Rust user or even considering it, you can put your two cents into the survey. The goals here are really simple. First, to build a shared understanding of where we are. And the second, to figure out and identify where we should be going at a high level. With that, they ask you to take a short survey to get your input for the next decade, not for features, but for purpose. So how can you take the survey? Well, first off, I'm gonna put a link in the description below directly to the survey. I'm going to give you a taste on what exactly is included here. The Rust Vision Survey of 2025. The survey is divided into three sections, totaling 16 questions. It should take you around five minutes to complete. It's looking for three basic things, including basic demographic information, free form questions about Rust usage, and personal information referrals or other experiences. Nothing is publicly shared, but they would love to hear about your experiences, both individually and part of companies or organizations. So what kind of questions are we filling out here? First one is, are you an individual or company organization? How comfortable do you feel writing the code? Anywhere from one to five. We also have how large your company is. If you write Rust code, is the code that you write in Rust? They look for either open source or closed source proprietary. In what domains do you use Rust? For projects that you have not used Rust for, what programming language did you use instead? Where do you live? And many more questions. So again, if you want to voice your opinion you've been using Rust, this is a great way to help try to shape the next decade of Rust. Again, with a lot of controversy happening in the Linux versus C Rust divide, it'll be interesting to see how Rust steers their ship for the next decade. I'll be looking closer into all of this, especially once we get the survey results. But the next thing I want to cover is super exciting. We have fresh benchmarks of Ubuntu 25.04 using the GNOME 48 KDE Plasma 6.3 Wayland sessions compared to lightweight versions of the X11 desktops, including XFCE 4.20 and LXQt 2.1 and how they perform when it comes to Linux gaming. Despite the fact that XFCE and LXQ are considered more minimal and can be more performant over Wayland sessions, well, now we have some hard benchmarks thanks to Michael over at Pharonix as he tested this on a Radon Gaming Linux desktop, and the results are pretty great. In almost all categories, especially on gaming, here's the key. We have GNOME Wayland, GNOME XORG, KD Plasma Wayland, KD Plasma XORG, and XFCE XORG. Here are the games that were played, including F1 2020, Hitman 2, Tesseract, 
Batman, Arkham Knight, and Counter-Strike. The wild part is, no matter how you go around and play, clearly anything Wayland outperforms. And you can see this really in three of the games, Hitman 2, Tesseract, and Dirt Rally 2.0, where the performance levels are much higher being played on Wayland sessions in comparison to doing it on Xorg. You can see the difference here as I'm shading it in between Gnome Wayland and Gnome Xorg. That's about a 20 to 30% boost in performance just by using the Wayland versus Xorg implementation. But really when the breakdown starts happening, as you go through the various different sections and the different games, pretty much Gnome Wayland is on top for every single one of these games. This benchmark is ran under the Steam Play Proton on Linux, and all these numbers mean are frames per second. And what's happening is, well, Wayland is on top for almost all games and benchmarks, which is really cool to see. As Wayland is clearly winning, modern Wayland sessions for Gnome and KDE are not just viable to outperform older X11 setups, but even against traditionally faster, minimal environments like XFCE. And lightweight and unbloated does not necessarily mean better performance. And this just goes to show it in gaming. Wayland has been maturing over the years and the stability and efficiency that comes with modern graphical desktop environments is starting to supersede X11 as it's starting to really show its age. This is just reinforcing that Wayland is the future. So those of you who haven't quite yet moved over to Wayland, start thinking about it as gaming is shaping up to be even better on Wayland. You can go through all of these benchmarks yourself, but I'll just ruin the surprise for you. The Wayland sessions really do outperform even the lightest X11 desktops. Of course, thanks to Michael from Veronix for posting these results on openbenchmarking.org. I want to hear what you think about Wayland versus X11. And have you ran into similar things running games on the varying different windowing servers or managers? We covered a lot of great news this week and you wouldn't want to miss more. So make sure to subscribe for more. Also, smash that like button on the way back up. Catch me in a great community on Discord and I'll catch you in another video. Thanks for watching. Linux can be hard to understand, but I take the most commonly used terms, commands, and subjects in Linux and I break them down into simple to read documents, including Linux terms, flashcards, a checklist, a cheat sheet, and a mind map. And if you're ready to level up your Linux experience and knowledge, go to SavvyNick.com now and get access to these sheets.